Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate, person, peace be upon his Prophet Muhammad and all of his Prophets, and greetings to all of you. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq mentioned also that in his Usul al Tariqah, that it is from the Usul of the path of the Muslims to love the Prophet وسلم, and therefore studying his Sirah is important in, in actually achieving what's called the Ma'iya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there is a hadith, Al Mar'u Ma'aman Ahab. A man is with the one he loves. So the Ma'iya of the Prophet وسلم, through love of him. And the ma'iyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a physical ma'iyah. Allah is not physically with you. Right? The Prophet is not physically with you. But there is a ma'iyah of nusra, foes, and madad. Uh, help and succor that comes from loving Allah and His Messenger. And, and if you love them, then you get that. And if you don't, you don't. And uh, also... One of the things Ibn Hamdun says is it should never be said that most of the seerah relates to the habits of the Prophet, the adat. And the adat, there's no amal related to them. Because part of the usul, uh, our usul in juristic methodology, that there are two types of uh, actions of the Prophet One is an action which is called an ada, and another is Ibadah. And it's interesting Arabic how it has these, you know, ada and ibadah. The difference is a ba. And it's just interesting. There are a lot of things like that in Arabic. That uh, the ada is a norm. And ibadah is uh, an act of worship. Now there's a, a proverb of the Arabs which says, Everything is an ada. Kullu shay'an ada, walaw al ibadah. Everything is an ada, even ibadah. And what that means is everything is a habit, including worship. In other words, you have to habituate yourself uh, to things that you do regularly, including worship. So you, you habituate yourself to praying on time. You habituate yourself to uh, reading the Quran. Right? These, are, these have to become ada for you. It's a habit. It's something you do constantly. The word Eid, it comes from a, a word ada, ya'udu, which means to, to return. So a, a, an ada is something you return to because it's a habit. Right? Uh, for instance, it was a habit of the Prophet Wasallam that if he إِذَا تَعَجَّبَ مِنْ أَمْرٍ يَقْرِبُ كَفْتَهُ He would say, Subhanallah, and flip his hand over like that. That was an ad that, that we'll read about, inshallah, in the Shema'ir of Imam Tirmidhi. So, there are many things. Another ad of the Prophet وسلم, is when he walked and somebody called him, he would stop and turn fully around. He, he wouldn't just like stop and look to see who's calling him. He would stop and turn fully and face the person with his whole being. So, that's, that's an ad of the Prophet. Another ada of the Prophet ﷺ is that uh, he ate on the floor, right? There's no hukum shar'i that says you have to eat on the floor. There's no hukum shar'i that says you have to eat with your hand. There's no hukum shar'i that says that you have to uh, um, wear certain types of clothes, right? Those are all related to the adat. But what Ibn Hamdun is saying here, رضي الله عنه, is that we should not consider studying the seerah as looking at these habits of the Prophet ﷺ as points of interest. Oh, and by the way, the Prophet ﷺ liked uh, yaqteen, uh, pumpkin or squash, right? When you read that he likes squash, you should like squash. And that is the way our early community was with the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, Muhammad ibn Aslam, one of the great setup, actually refused to eat uh, batik, which is uh, watermelon, even though there's a hadith that the Prophet liked watermelon, but he refused to eat it because he didn't know the way the Prophet ate it. In other words, there was nothing in the Sunnah that told how the Prophet actually ate watermelon. Whereas with grapes, it's told, for instance, that he would put uh, a few grapes in his mouth from the stem and he would pull them 
and then some of the juice would flow onto his beard. So a lot is in him. So there are many examples of that, but the point being is that is how much they loved the Prophet They wanted to follow him. Now just to mention something about that that I think is very significant. One of the things that we know now uh, from studies in psychology is that human beings are imitative by nature. And it begins early on. The baby will begin to imitate micro-movements of the mother uh, when she talks to the baby. One of the interesting things about uh, babies is that when they're first born, the actual distance of their vision is from the breast to the eyes and the face of the mother. That's all they can see. They can't focus beyond that. So, and what happens is they begin to absorb immediately from the mother certain movements, which is often why you can recognize in grown children their parents' expressions you like if you, if you know somebody's parents well and you watch them, you'll notice that they laugh the same way that they do. They'll often have similar gestures. They'll even sometimes blink in the similar fashion or do things with their facial gestures. Um, it's very common. Why? Because human beings imitate. Not only human beings, but animals uh, imitate uh, immediately. So the point of all of this is that we are imitative by nature. This is part of the human nature. One of the things that the Western, uh, particularly America, has perfected is what they call this kind of uh, operative um, conditioning, which uh, in behavioralism, uh, they, for instance, I mean, the reason they pay these uh, athletes millions of dollars uh, to to be on a Wheaties box or to wear a certain type of tennis shoes is because they know people are going to imitate them. Why? Because they see them as something uh, that they want to be like. And, because, and this is human nature. That's the whole point of this. This is not, you can say, oh, that's just stupid. I don't do that. You think you don't. You just do it at a different, you know, on a different level. Everybody does this. It's just there's degrees of it. Some are quite gross and, and uh, and, and, and unreasonable, like wanting to be like Michael Jordan or something like that, I would consider that really stupid. But, you know, another person might not. I mean, th this is why Michael Jordan makes millions of dollars for uh, selling goods that he probably doesn't even use. Um, so the point being is that this is part of our nature. Now, what the Quran says, وَلَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ you have in the Messenger of Allah the best example to imitate. In other words, since you're going to imitate, which is human nature, Allah gave us the best human being to imitate. And that is why when you learn about his uh, character and his qualities, uh, out of love, you will want to imitate them. Because if you love somebody, your tendency is to imitate them. One of the things that disturbed Imam Shafi'i a great deal was when he went to Egypt after being in Iraq, and he was a student of Imam Al. He, everybody, the Egyptians were all Madakis at that point, and everybody wanted to know, how did Imam Madak eat? Because they, they knew he was his student, they would come to him, how did he eat? Wh which finger did he wear his ring on? Um, what did he do when, when he, uh, when in his mud? And they were, Imam, it really troubled Imam Shafi. It really bothered him, because they were more concerned about Imam Madak and what he did than they were with the Prophet of Allah. And this is why uh, he began to actually uh, go against the idea of the amal of the people of Medina and these type things, because he, did, he felt that there was a danger in that. The way I would interpret it as, as a Maliki is that what their concern was, was recognizing that Malik adhered more to the Sunnah uh, than anybody of his age. They wanted to know what he drank because they knew it would have been what the Prophet ﷺ drank. And this, is, um, this, is, this happens in every generation. This is part of, uh, of, of uh, human nature, right? You want to imitate the people that you follow. And uh, that uh, part of our tradition is finding people who follow the Prophet ﷺ and then learning from them, right? And so that, that is... That's really the point of learning this subject. And that's what Ibn Hamdun is warning us. Don't think that these are just adat that you should say, oh, that's the way he did. And this is something that modern Muslims uh, have been focusing on for about 100 years. Um, in fact, I actually heard somebody once in a 
uh, in a, a lecture, a Muslim, noted Muslim speaker, say how there was no benefit in listening to all these dis physical descriptions of the Prophet ﷺ, and that's really not the point. And, well, what we have to ask ourselves is, why is it that uh, Abu Isa, uh, a Tirmidhi, anhu, would have put a book in there with all those descriptions, and why is it that the Sahaba would have even transmitted them if they weren't relevant? In other words, the first community recognized the importance of loving the Prophet ﷺ and learning about him in all these various aspects. And one of the things about lovers is they want to hear, you know, oh, what did she say? Really? She said that? Well, what was she wearing? Really? She was a blue dress? Oh, you know, and this is what the lover did. They want to hear about the beloved, right? Tell me more. And, and that's the nature of ishq, of being in love. And there are people historically who have died from love of the Prophet It's transmitted as a hadith. I don't know. I've never seen the, the uh, Senate, but they mention it, and there's a wisdom in it. Whoever falls in love and conceals that love and then dies from it, he dies a shaheed. And um, afa, wa katama. And he was afid. In other words, he didn't do anything haram with the object of his love. And there's a famous story also of Imam Ibn Sina, uh, he was once um, uh, taking a case of this woman who was dying like marasma. She was just withering away, young girl. And he took her pulse, and, and he started talking to her about her family and, and where she lived. And, and when she mentioned where she lived, he said, oh, I know that area, and I guess do you, you must know the people. Do you know that family? And she said, yes. Do you know that family? She said, yes. And then he said, do you know that family? And then her pulse started going very fast. And then he said, oh, who do you know from that family? Do you know so-and-so? Do you know so-and-so? And then he got to uh, a young man from the family, and her pulse started racing. And then he realized that she was in love, and she was just dying <laughs> from ish, you know. And so he told the parents what, what the problem was. So that is a real thing. It's not an unreal thing. And I think people now, it's, it's uh, probably less so just because people don't have that capacity anymore um, to really... But that does happen to people. And uh, Imam al Bulsadi is said to have died from his uh, love of the Prophet So out of just yearning to be with them. Now... Another thing that I I Imam Ibn Jawzi says, عنه, uh, Ibn uh, Qayyim al Jawziya in, in, in Zad al Ma'ad, he says, um, if, إذا كانت سعادة الدارين معلقة بهدي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, uh, معلقة, if the sa'ada, uh, the felicitousness of the two abodes, the dunya and the akhira, is connected to the guidance of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, then he says, then it becomes incumbent on anyone who's sincere with his own soul, uh, to desire his soul's uh, safety and uh, uh, salvation and its felicitousness. And so he has to do that through learning about the guidance of the Prophet and the seerah of the Prophet and the affairs of the Prophet in order to remove him from the ignorant people and to place him amongst those people who follow the Prophet and are from his Shia, his group, and his hizb, his party. So what he's saying there really is it's, a, it's an obligation to actually uh, learn about the states of the Prophet so that you can follow them. The seventh uh, aspect of this science is tasawwur al-masairihi, is conceptualizing what its concerns are, and its concerns are going into the detailed descriptions of the life of the Prophet Wasallam and a knowledge of what is connected to his, his inward, his outward qualities, and also the history of his days and the uh, struggles uh, and successes of his life. So that's, that's the area of the Messiah. The fadila, the merit of this knowledge is what Shaykh Ibn Hamdun says, is that the merit of a knowledge is connected with the subject matter. And since the subject matter of this uh, knowledge is the, the, the greatest subject uh, 
uh, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Messenger of Allah. It is obviously an extremely virtuous uh, science and, uh, and one of the noblest of all the sciences. And now its benefits. Uh, Nishbatuhu is, it is one of the ulum al shariya right? Its category is that it's categorized as one of the sciences of uh, uh, the sharia, which is about the Prophet So that's its nisbah. The benefits, there are many benefits of this science. One of them is that it guides you to the path of suluk of the Prophet In other words, suluk of the Prophet is, salaka means to go down a path, yasliku. The salik is the, the wayfarer. The suluk is, is the, the path that one goes down, the way one goes down that path. And so learning about the Prophet ﷺ is learning how to be in the world. It's learning about the uswa al-hasana or iswa al-hasana. And it is learning about it in order that you can imitate this character. And one of the wisdoms of the Prophet ﷺ being a human being is that he is accessible to us in order that we imitate him. In other words, if the Prophet ﷺ had been an angel who came down to the earth, then people would say after that, well, we can't be like him. He's an angel. Right? We have no access to him. But the fact that he was a human being and that he had the struggles of a human being, he had the pain of a human being, he had the grief of a human being, he had the love of a human being, and he had uh, the human perfection realized in him. So the degree by which you follow him is the degree by which you achieve your own humanity. In other words, the closer you adhere to his character, inwardly and outwardly, the closer you come to human perfection. And this does not in any way eliminate the women by the fact that he was a man. Because the Prophet Wasallam is the most balanced human being. In other words, the Jamal and the Jalal qualities, uh, the, the, the Jamal, the beautiful qualities which are more dominant in women, and the majestic qualities which are more dominant in men, were perfected in him and realized in the most balanced way. In other words, he is the, the perfection of the Adamic uh, uh, creature. He is that perfection. And therefore, his qualities and his characteristics are as accessible to women as they are to men, with obviously certain exceptions. But his generosity applies to both male and female. His love applies to male and female. His devotion to Allah applies to male and female. Right? And in terms of those things that relate to women, then obviously the examples are in Maryam alayhi salam because she's an example to women in Khadija al kubra alayhi salam in Aisha radiallahu anha in uh, Um Salama in uh, Um al-Masakin all the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, and their noble qualities and that's why it's important for women also and men to study the characters and the lives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam's wives because that increases the iman and they're also examples for men as well as women in other words, Allah makes Maryam an example for the Qanitin, which is a male before it's female. In other words, Maryam is for the Qanitin, the people of Qunut, of obedience. So that's just, I thought, important to memorize. Another benefit of learning about the Prophet ﷺ is that it fills one's heart with awe of the Messenger of Allah. Because when you begin to realize who he was, the struggles that existed in his life, and his responses to the tribulations that he had, because he said, the greatest of you in tribulation is the prophets. And then the closest to them, the siddiqeen, and then the closest to them, the shuhada, and then the closest to them, the sadiqeen. Because that's the order uh, the Nibiyina, Siddiqina, Shuhada, or Salihin. That's the order of closeness to Allah. The closest are the Prophets, the next closest are the And in the Quran, two are mentioned Maryam and uh, Yusuf, who's also a Prophet, but he has Maqam al Siddiqiyya. 
and then also Abu Bakr is from the Siddiqeen and many of the other Sahaba and there are people who come after them who are the Ulama Al-Amilun or the Siddiqun, the Awliya of Allah and then the Shuhada or the next in rank people who die and then the Salihin are the people of Taqwa from the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu it could be a very simple person who has very little knowledge but he has Taqwa of Allah inwardly and outwardly and that's a Salih a Salih is somebody who does what Allah tells him and avoids what he prohibited him with the exception of the Lamam small wrong actions that are purified by his wudu and by his istighfar and other things and then everybody else is Fasiq they're Fasiqun that's from the Muslims and then from the, the other people they're kuffar and that's the lowest and obviously uh, the kuffar, the lowest of the kuffar are the munafiqun who are kafir inwardly and Muslim outwardly so uh, that's the ranking, humanity is in ranks and everybody has a maqam every human being has a maqam none of us are prophets, we're out of that possibility but you're either a siddiq, a shaheed, a salih, a fasiq a munafiq or a kafir is going to fall into one of those categories and the reality of it is you might be a shaheed and you don't even know it in other words al-amal bi khawatimiha actions are by how they're sealed so irrelevant where you are now you know somebody's life could look really bad now but Allah gives them tawbah and they become from the people of Allah later or somebody's life could look really good now and a'udhu billah down the road la qadr Allah they lose it and they lose their iman. So that's why we don't Al Aman min Makarilla is from the Kaba'ir. To feel safe from Allah's plan is to is from the Kaba'ir. It's an enormity. To feel safe from Allah that something might happen that you fail the test. And to have yes, to have despair from the mercy of Allah is also from the Kaba'ir. And this is why the deen is based on khawf and raja. And when you study the life of the Prophet, it will increase your understanding of that because you see somebody who had more khawf than anybody and had more raja than anybody. So he's the imam of, of all the maqams. And then the other thing is when you have awe of the Prophet ﷺ, you will have awe for his teaching. And you will have awe for those things that relate to his tradition. And this is in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَ الْقُلُوبِ Those who have ta'zim, exaltation of the, the symbols of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is a result of taqwa in the heart. So part of learning about the Prophet ﷺ is increasing in iman, which will increase you in ta'zim, which is a result of taqwa that is nurtured in the heart. So it's very important from that aspect. And that is from the greatest means that will save us in the Akhirah. Right? The people of Taqwa are the people that Allah gives safety to. Another thing is learning how to draw near to Allah through the two uh, rungs of Sabar and Shukr. In other words, Sabar, which is patience, and Shukr, which is gratitude, these are two rungs on the ladder of drawing near to Allah. Patience and gratitude. And when you study the life of the Prophet ﷺ, there's nothing greater than his patience and his gratitude. That's what constantly shows up, is that he was a grateful servant and he was a patient servant. He was shakur and sabur. He was shakur and sabur. Battle of Badr. He won the battle and showed great gratitude. When he got back from the battle, he found out the news that his daughter died. And yet, he was with absolute patience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He lost, he buried all of his children except for Fatima. I mean, how many parents will do that in their life? How many parents will bury all of their children with the exception of one? Six children. It's something awesome if you think about that. And yet, no complaint. Never to Allah. He stood in the night until his feet swelled from edema, which happens if you stand so long because the, the circulation, the gravity begins to uh, impact and, and you can get swelling in your ankle. It's very common as you get older. And uh, he got until his feet swelled. And Aisha said, uh, 
Ya Rasulullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you all of your actions, what went before and what comes after. Meaning, and his worst action is to leave a virtuous, a more virtuous thing for a virtuous thing. That's the worst that he can do. But she said that to him, and he said, Awalam akun abdan shakura, shouldn't I be a grateful slave? In other words, for doing that, shouldn't I show up? And that's one of the greatest benefits, really, of all those things. Thank you.